Good morning. I'm Ashley Rooney from Lexington Remembers World War II Committee. Today, we have Jim Silva. James Lawrence Silva is his real name. He's a World War II vet, a P-51 pilot, a POW, and then he went back to fight the Korean War. He's going to be quite a story he's going to tell us. So let me introduce Jim. Jim, why yes. don't you tell us how it all began? You moved into Lexington when you were a mere babe. Yep. Yep. And you went to Lexington High School? And I went to Parker School and then Muzzy Junior High and High School, yeah. On right. Mass Avenue there. And you graduated in 1942. And yeah. you were a member of the soccer and golf teams, I understand. Yes. And, uh, when I graduated, uh, World War II was on the way because we had been bombed by Japanese. And so uh, I could feel the hot breath of the draft on the back of my neck. So I figured I better do something. <laughs> and, uh, I, I wanted to be a pilot. But, uh, I, so I enrolled in Northeastern as a freshman figuring if I had a year of college, I might have a better chance of getting what I wanted. And uh, I went two weeks after I got out of Lexington, I went to Northeastern as a freshman. And uh, they later uh, agreed to let me finish my freshman year, which I did. And in April, I went on active duty and I went down to, uh, through Fort Devens, down to Nashville, to the reclassification center. And there they gave me all kinds of tests to figure out my mental and physical and emotional state, all kinds of tests. And I passed them all and became a candidate to become a fighter pilot. Wow. You were age 19 at that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the interesting part so far is I grew up, my family didn't have a car. <laughs> I, I never drove a car so far up to this point. And, uh, I, so there you were steering an airplane? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I walked, I rode a bicycle, and once in a while I took a bus, but uh, never a car. Wow. So this is going to wow. be a different experience for me. Your parents must have been overwhelmed, the fact that you were flying an airplane, <laughs> and they I, didn't have a car. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were. They uh, he never said too much about it, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure they liked me going into the war. Oh, I'm sure they didn't. But the other part was okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it must have been very terrifying for them. There you were up in the air flying, and they didn't even drive. That was yeah. overwhelming. So I went down to uh, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, to pre-flight. Went through a couple of months there, physical training. And uh, uh, learning the Army way to do things and all that sort of thing. And after two months there, I went to Bennettsville, South Carolina. There I learned to fly. And that's where the picture is of the biplane that you have uh, with, where I'm with my brother. That's where I learned to fly. And that's where after eight hours, I, I soloed. Wow. After eight hours, you were yeah. soloing? Yeah, and uh, that the the instructor goes up with you up to that point, and uh, always, and and he teaches you to land and take off and all that sort of thing. And when he thinks you're ready and won't kill yourself, he lets you go up by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been incredible. And you won't get lost when you get up there because they teach you all the boundaries they want you to stay in. You know. Do you remember how you felt that first time? Huh? How did you feel that first time? Were you scared or were you like, whoa, I'm finally up here? A uh, little, bit, little bit of both at that first time. Yeah. Had you already learned how to parachute out? Uh, no, they never, that came much later. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, it was a, a very... Uh, Slow-moving, uh, you know, underpowered airplane. So it, it was there to teach us to fly 
and using air currents and all this sort of thing. And later on, we get the fighters where you can use power to pull yourself out of a situation. So right. this one was very underpowered. And I learned to do loops and uh, slow rolls and uh, snap rolls. What's a snap roll? A snap roll is when you uh, turn, the, turn the plane around very fast. You hardly, you don't have time to really see what's going on. You pull the stick back and to the right and the plane just whips around. So you go upside down. As opposed to a slow roll where you gradually make the turn and uh, oh, okay. uh, and you got to control your stuff so your plane stays level and all that sort of thing. Uh -huh. uh, so we, we learned all kinds of maneuvers, learning to coordinate the, the rudder pedals and the stick for the ailerons on the wings. And uh, uh, so that's what we were doing in that one, learning to coordinate and fly the plane. So we were learning flying. That was two months in there. And at the end of that time, you get a check ride with a different instructor. And uh, if he passes you, you continue on to the next phase. If he doesn't, you go out of the program, you wash oh. out. So uh, the next phase would be two months in basic training. And, and that would be a little heavier plane, a single wing. And, uh, and there we learn to fly nights and formation and uh, as well as all the previous maneuvers of loops and rolls and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we did two months of, of that sort of thing of formation flying and night flying and stuff. And uh, at the end of that time, we had a check ride by a different instructor. And again, if we passed, we moved on. And uh, then we went to advanced flying. And, and that was a little heavier plane, a little bigger plane. And uh, we learned all those things, the same things we learned before, but we also uh, added some new things of formation flying and stuff and night flying and, and a little gunnery in there. And once we graduated from that place, we, we went to another field. Up till now, the instructor always rode with us for the first few rides when we hit a new plane. Mm -hmm. And then after he thought you could handle it okay, he, he left and you were on your own. After advanced flying, we went in a fighter plane, a P-40, which only had one seat. So he never went with me. No. I went okay. first, first time. And, and, and the P-40 had a long nose in front of you and you couldn't see anything in front of you. And uh, so the first time up, I was on my own. And uh, that's when they told me that uh, the P-40 had an unusual characteristic on takeoff and it would be about halfway down the runway, the right rudder pedal would kick me back, kick me back and I had to kick it right back in. <laughs> I handled that, <laughs> and it worked. And so we took off, but uh, you could tell people were scared because they would take, be taking off and flying out of sight in the distance, and the wheels were still down. They hadn't they hadn't taken their hands off any of the controls, the stick or the throttle, you know. Yeah. So people were, were a little bit uptight there, but we got used to it after a while. Right. Uh, did you lose anybody in um, flight training? I mean, did anybody? Yes. I assume people washed out. Did anybody die? Oh, yeah. People washed out. And, uh, and people were in basic training it was the first time we lost anybody. That was the second stage. And people like to fly low right on the, right on the ground. Over, so you had to flip over trees and stuff. And, oh, and, uh, yeah. They really didn't have that much experience flying, so sometimes they didn't quite make it, and they would crash into something. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and they they would bring a big flat butt, flat bed truck into, into under the base, and they would leave it on show there, 
So you see pieces of meat, meat hanging from various parts of the airplane. And I think they were trying to give us a message not to stay down low and buzz. Right. And we right. weren't supposed to do that because we weren't ready for that. And, and then other than that, we uh, didn't have any big problems. People just washed out because they weren't able to do the things well enough. And uh, so then we went down to uh, Sarasota and there we, we flew P-40s all the time. And there we learned gunnery, uh, both shooting things on the ground, ground targets and shooting things in the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we learned fighter tactics and stuff. Did you have a crew by then, or? Uh, no, well, it, just a one-man plane. Okay, so you're still flying solo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all the while until Korea, I never had a crew. There were always one-man plane, one-seat plane. Oh, that must have been lonely. <laughs> yeah. So you, <laughs> well, it was, it was nice. It was a little smaller, and they maneuvered well, and I, I love to do all the aerobatics up there, and I love to, uh, down south, they have some nice big cumulus clouds, and we used to dive in them and dive around holes in them, and you know, we used to play tag, <laughs> follow the leader, you know. Yep. You know, yep. We had a great time. I, I loved that. Great, great flying. And, so uh, when, when did you go abroad? Well, after after Sarasota, I went to uh, I, Meridian, Mississippi. I heard they, they had P-51s there, and I wanted to fly a P-51 because they were a beautiful airplane. And so I went there for two months, and I learned reconnaissance kind of techniques as well as artillery adjustment and stuff like that. And I was there for two months, and then I went overseas after that. And where were you based overseas? England? Overseas, we, we landed in Europe, and a couple of weeks later, we went into France, but uh, we were in Normandy, and uh, we didn't have, uh, there were no real uh, cave, cave runways or anything. We had steel, steel strips they put down for us to land and take off. And, so this was after? Um, this was after D-Day. It was after DA, okay. Yeah, we got there, we got in France in, in uh, early September. And, uh, but they were still uh, close close to Normandy. They didn't, the, the D-Day was held up from June 6th to, to uh, uh, July 27th by the hedgerows. They couldn't advance any further. And, uh, right. Uh, but they broke out of there about July 27th. And so we were there, Patton broke out, but he, he wanted to go real fast. So he went real fast toward Paris and, and he didn't leave any troops on his right flank to protect him, the right flank. And our job was to do reconnaissance of that right flank and find out if there were any troop concentrations, any trucks or tanks or you know, any activity by the enemy there. Mm -hmm. We would phone, phone that back in, radio that back in, and uh, they would send a bunch of fighters out to take care of it. And they, he would send some troops back from the front of the of his drive, the point of his drive. Mm -hmm. and so that's what we were doing there is, is the reconnaissance. And uh, the reconnaissance is, is, is a two-man flight, and one man stays low maybe down on a thousand feet. And uh, on the flight I was on, the reconnaissance man was down there. I was up about 5,000 feet and I was providing cover so that no one would jump him and no surprise him, come up and shoot him down. That's what I was there to protect him. Right. And so I was up at 5,000 feet, but I was, I was, flying to the left and right and up and down a thousand feet at a time, you know, yeah. Yeah, and keeping my eyes open for the skies and, and anything down low that might jump him. So that way he could concentrate on the reconnaissance. And yeah. uh, that's when I got in trouble. Well, tell us about when you got into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
while I was looking all around and uh, checking the skies and all this stuff. And one time I looked around and I looked forward again. And when I did, I saw all these black puffs. It was a big, a big cube of the black anti-aircraft puffs above me, below me, in front of me, behind me, all around me. And uh, I, then I felt the plane get lifted up about five or 10 feet. And I said, whoa, that was a close one. <laughs> and it was, that was the one that hit me. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I called down the captain uh, Smith and told him I'd been hit and he came up to help me. But, uh, the engine was getting rougher and uh, pretty soon smoke was coming out mm. and uh, coming outside and also coming in through the inside to the cockpit so I couldn't see the uh, instrument panel. No oh boy. And, and I, I had less, less power so I was gradually starting to lose altitude and uh, I had cranked the canopy open uh, to get the smoke out of the cockpit so maybe I could see the instrument panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the smoke got heavy enough where that didn't help, so I figured I was going to have to bail out. Also, uh, the plane was losing altitude. So I, uh, uh, the way you get out of a P-51, there are two options they usually give you. One is to undo your seatbelt and your shoulder harness and your throat mic and your headset. And, and, and then you hit the crank to release the canopy. There's a handle that it releases the whole bubble canopy. And uh, you turn the plane over and just drop out. And uh, that's one way. <laughs> I didn't like that one. <laughs> I could see one. something about turning the plane over and gone. Yeah. So what did you do? Uh, the other way was to uh, un undo your harness, shoulder harness and seatbelt and the throat mic and stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> and then pull the crank and release the uh, canopy and climb out on the wing. Oh. And, and slide off the trailing edge of the wing if you can wow. wing that long. Uh, but I had a little hitch. I I had opened the canopy to uh, with the crank to let the smoke out. Right. And when I was going out, I didn't release the canopy. I just was going out because the crank had opened it. And I started out and I had forgotten to disconnect my throat mic and my headset. So I slid back in and disconnected those. And the way back out, my knee hit the crank, which rolled the canopy back. And the canopy slid closed with me half in and half out. And uh, I. I had forgotten that I needed to release the canopy because the canopy was already open. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so I did a lot of kicking and pushing and pulling and tugging. And the plane is losing altitude. Oh, my. The plane was going downhill all this time. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I finally got enough of me out. And the plane must have been going about three, 350 or something miles per hour. And it, and it slipstream. I got enough me out so the slipstream just yanked me right out of there. <sighs> and uh, when it did, then I checked to see if the plane wasn't around me and pulled the ripcord for the parachute. And I, when I finally pulled the parachute to uh, uh, open it, I was only about two or three tree heights uh, up in the air, so I didn't have much longer going down. <laughs> and, uh, and I then I looked down. I saw I was I was heading right to land, right in the middle of my fiery plane. The plane was on fire. Oh. And I was, we didn't have steerable panel parachutes then, so I and and you can pull the ripcord 
the uh, shroud lines a little bit and, and you can slide a little bit dangerous because if you pull a little too much, you'll slip the arrow from under the parachute and you just drop down. So they didn't recommend you do that. And I wasn't too happy with landing in the fire either. <laughs> and I noticed that I was automatically drifting a little bit off the fire. So I landed in the field and in the same field the plane was in. And uh, I was gathering up the chute to head for the hedgerows and uh, so I could dive over them and get in cover. And, uh, and I heard gunfire and I thought, oh boy, they're shooting at me. <laughs> and uh, so I started running across the field and the shroud lines would catch on bushes and I would tumble and everything, but I just kept going and I got to the hedgerow and I, I dove over the hedgerow. Wow. By the time I was diving over the hedgerow, I realized they weren't firing me. That was my own ammunition getting cooked off. With no. <laughs> fire, yeah. <laughs> so that, uh, that was good. So I started burying the parachute and the leaves at the base of this uh, hedgerow. And uh, I was just about done, and I looked up, and about 80 feet away or something, I saw this German leveling a rifle toward me. Oh. So I had to oh. make a quick decision. Do I run or do I give up? I, you know, I figured I, I could still run pretty fast then. But then I thought, well, I don't know. And it's a good thing I didn't run, because on the other side of the hedgerow, Another German had come down in a camouflage cape, and he was about 15 feet away from me. So if I had decided to run, he could have shot me without, he wouldn't have missed. Yeah, wouldn't have missed. Oh, yeah. boy. And so, How old were you in all this? You were about 22 at this time? No, well, I was 20. 20. Oh. Yeah, it was 1944. I was born okay. in 24. 20. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it... Uh, a little, little more, a little more excitement than I had planned for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so they, your hands went up, and they, they took you as a yeah, prisoner. They took me to the anti-aircraft station, and sat me there. And then pretty soon, an officer came in a car, and he took me to a, to a house, and uh, <clears throat> there they sat me in the dining room and uh, the woman was in the kitchen cooking food so they they brought a, a private a german private in who spoke very good english and uh, <clears throat> he had worked for the canard ship lines and so he knew all about the united states he knew about baseball he knew about major leagues, minor leagues, and all that stuff. And uh, so we had a, a good lunch there. They gave me a cigar, which I didn't smoke, so I gave it to him. And sure. his, his purpose was he was trying to get information from me. I didn't give him any. And uh, but uh, So that they treated me very nicely there. And then we left there after lunch and went down to the river, and I took the ferry across the river and uh, hoping that the, the Americans wouldn't strafe the, the tugboat. Yes. And, and uh, they lost their way. They finally found their way to Camp Franco, the camp where I was kept. And uh, they uh, put me in solitary confinement. Ooh. It really wasn't solitary confinement because there were fleas and, and rats in there. It was a pile of hay in the corner that I slept on. And they were, there was rats underneath there chewing. When I put my head down, I could hear them. Oh. Yeah. They didn't chew on you, though. Yeah. No, 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 they didn't. That was very good. I guess I wasn't tasty enough. Actually. <laughs> and uh, then they took me out and interrogated me briefly. And... Uh, I just gave my name, rank, and serial number, and they put me back in solitary confinement. And uh, the next day, they took me out to interrogate me. And this, this guy was a professional interrogator. 
he was much better, but he didn't get any more information from me. I just gave him name, rank, and serial number. <clears throat> they want to know, you know, where I flew from, how many planes, what we were doing, and all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I didn't give him any of that. And uh, after a couple days of that, he uh, he pulled out a gun and put it on the table, and he said, you know, I can take you out back. There's a big swamp on back of this camp. And he said, I can take you out there in the swamp and shoot you, and no one would ever know. So you better think about giving me some information that I want to hear. And uh, I, I didn't. So he put me back in solitary. And then I took me out another day. And, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm getting impatient here. I can take you out and shoot you. Don't, don't stretch me too much, you know. Uh, and no one would ever know because it's a big swamp out there. So I went back into solitary. They gave me time to think about that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought, well, I can give them my home address. My folks were nobody of any importance to them. And uh, so when I get out, I gave them my home address and, and they uh, they let me out. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, they, just, they never hurt you in all that time? No, they, no torture, no no nothing. The food was horrible uh, in the camp. Uh, you know, we would get uh, a loaf of bread with about five people sharing a loaf of bread. And once in a while, there might be a piece of cheese, a small piece of cheese. And for lunch and dinners combined, we would get a bowl of potato soup with no potatoes. The mm. Germans would take all the potatoes out and we would get the rest of it. The watery stuff. Yeah, well, we were, there a lot, were there other Americans there? Were there Americans or Brits? I mean, who were your fellow prisoners? Uh, the fellow prisoners were, there were 19 Americans and three British and one French guy, supposedly. Then I didn't know he was Russian then, but he was labeled as French then to us. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was in charge of the 19 Americans and the other people didn't really care about them. So I I had to take care of my 19 guys. And How did you get to be in charge of them? I, I was a second lieutenant and they were all enlisted men. They were okay. they were infantry and tank tank people, they were armored Mm -hmm. uh, drivers and tank drivers and uh, they all had all interesting stories about how they were captured and how many people were shot while mm -hmm. they were fighting the Germans before they got captured and uh, much worse than mine is because you are walking on patrol and suddenly the, the the lead scout would be shot right in the head and dropped down no oh. And uh, so that, that's not a very good sight. No, no, it's not. So Have it's you stayed in touch with these people? Huh? Have you stayed in touch, in contact with these guys? Uh, some of them later on. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, oh, about uh, 50 years after I got out, I, uh, when we were there, when we were exchanged, we, I had a 100 franc note and everybody signed their home address on that note. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so about 50 years later, I thought, well, let me see if I can get in touch with any of these guys. Because I, I had a the video of us marching out mm -hmm. and uh, I thought I would send it to them. And uh, so I, I got about 11 people out of the 19. That's great. Yes, yeah, so that was good, and, and and I got some very nice letters back about these guys saying that their sons had never seen their grandfather and so forth, and here they could see him actually marching, you know, actually moving out, and they were so excited about that, and I was glad I did that. Yeah, I wondered who took that video. Was that Red Cross? Uh, the vi no, the video was of, of our marching. When we get out, I, I, I looked up the road, I, I got all the guys off the bus, and when we had, you know, less than a quarter of a mile ahead was a whole group of people. 
And I told our guys, I said, up there, there's probably high-ranking American officers, high-ranking German officers. And I said, there'll be a lot of photographers and uh, all that sort of thing. And so I said, let's let's make it good. We'll, we'll look good. Oh, up and shoulders back and we'll show them we're Americans, you know. That's great. Boy, did you get out at the... Did you get out at the end of the war or before? Uh, before the end of the war. Oh. I got out in November of 44, November 29th. Oh, that was great. Yeah, I was, I was in prison about two and a half months. You probably lost a lot of weight. I on did. that weak potato soup. I lost some weight, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so these guys marched up there and, and they it brought tears to my eyes the way they were so straight and shoulders mm-hmm. back and, and they had been in prison some of them longer than I had and uh, so we marched right into the crew and there were photographers all over the place there were American army photographers there were German photographers there were uh, commercial photographers and mm-hmm. all, all kinds of people so a lot of people took pictures of, of them marching of us marching through there wow and uh, and so, uh, at that point, were you sent home? And that was the end of the war for you. Well, I, I had a choice, and uh, uh, but the war was going on in the Pacific, and I knew because I hadn't been over there very long in, in France. So I knew if I went home, I'd get a month's leave, and they would ship me out to the Pacific. And I didn't swim that well, so. I thought I would stay with my crew, so I, I asked if I could stay with my squadron, and they said, well, yeah, we'll get an okay, I guess, with the Geneva Convention, if they had caught me again in the same theater of operations, they could do anything they want with me. So I needed to get uh, an okay from General Eisenhower's staff, and so... I had to wait and wait till I got that okay. So in the meantime, I was I was flying planes that were all shot up and repaired, make sure they were okay to fly missions again and stuff like that, and ferrying planes, and, and until I finally got the okay. But, uh, and then when I finally got home uh, after the war ended. Uh, I went back to Northeast and, mm. and uh, finished getting my BS in mechanical engineering. And I, but I carpooled two, two girls from Arlington and from Lexington. By now I was driving. <laughs> 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 and I, I lived in Lexington and they lived in Arlington, so it was right on the way. So I carpooled the two of them into Boston. And uh, one of them, Dot Pepper, we uh, uh, began to get a little closer. Carpooling turned to dating, and uh, so we, we dated for a while and went on various t- dates and stuff. And uh, after I get through with uh, Northeast and graduated from there, while I was looking for a job, I got a letter. That, Asked me to go back, not asked me, telling me to go back in the service. They, they were going to send me to Korea. And uh, so that's how I got, got into Korea. And, uh, <clears throat> and while I was in Korea, Dot, Dot and I corresponded via snail mail. Snail mail. Mm-hmm. And uh, she would send me nice pictures of herself. And so, so I proposed to her via snail mill. Yes. And, and she accepted via snail mill. So uh, after, we, after I got home from Korea, flying, flying my 33 missions over there, uh, we got married. And wow. You had 33 missions in Korea? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, were you still doing reconnaissance, or were you doing another kind of plane? I was in a two-engine uh, B-26. It was, uh, uh, we were armed reconnaissance. We had, we, we were fighting now. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
we we had B-26s, which had eight guns in the nose, eight fifty caliber guns in the nose, and three in each wing. So that's 14 uh, 50 caliber uh, guns. And so when, and the, the wing guns were a aimed in so that they would merge about a thousand feet out. <clears throat> and uh, so when all 14 guns hit something, they really knew it. It would take a two and a half truck ton truck and just blow it right off the road. Wow. And, uh, so we were flying nights because the North Koreans had come down and they had driven every, everybody, the South Koreans and the Americans down almost off the peninsula. And so the Americans got in there soon enough to stop that, but then they were still bringing supplies and troops down at night. So we were flying over there at night to stop the people from North Koreans from bringing down troops and ammunition and tanks and stuff. And so that's what we were doing. Mm. Yeah. We did all, all kinds of, the first trip there, uh, we uh, was a little, little funny. We saw a, a truck coming down the road. This was at night, but we could, we could see well enough. And, uh, and he ducked in the woods. He heard us, I guess. So after we flew our mission around looking for targets and shooting up other targets, we came back down the road and there he was out on the road again. And so, <laughs> so this time he didn't get away. <laughs> yeah. But we, uh, we also flew, uh, we got a call to go over on one hill because the Americans were in trouble. The North Koreans were on one side of the hill and the Americans were on the other. <clears throat> and uh, so we flew over there and the flare ship had lit up so it was like daylight. So we flew down and, and machine guns and, and, and rocketed the enemy on the other side of the uh, hill just over the ridge. And, uh, and then we'd fly around again and, and uh, hit another spot. And the, the people on the ground would tell us where they wanted us to hit, where they were getting a lot of a lot of casualties from some spots. So we would hit the spots they would tell us, and then we would hit the spots of people who were firing at us. Mm -hmm. And we we so we we did a lot of work there, and and the guys on the ground thanked us and said they were all set now; they could move. And so we did. We got a lot of holes in the plane there, though. But you did. So how many years were you in the military? Uh, I was in from April of, uh, April to of 44. And for about a, uh, in Europe, I was there for about a year and a half, I think. And uh, I was, and I was at Korea. I went in in September or August. And I was there August of 50. Uh, February 52, I have. 52, yeah. That was February of 52. So, so, did, so did you get to come home at all while you were in Korea? Or just no, you and Don kept writing? No, that was, that was work. Wow. But then you came home and married Dot and had three daughters. Yes. Oh. yes. So there was a happy ending to the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a happy ending. Yeah. We uh, we got married. I got out February 2nd. And we got married uh, in March 15th. And it, Dot's, Dot's mother had, had lost a son in World War II. He was in naval aviation. No. And she also lost her husband about eight months before we got married. Oh. So she was alone. So we moved in with her so she wouldn't be lonely. And, uh, and we stayed with her for a couple of years. A little, little bit, a little bit uh, interesting being just married and being in a bedroom next to your mother-in-law. Yes. <laughs> 
but she was a great mother-in-law. Okay. And after a couple of years, we moved out to Lexington. Ah. And bought a house there and raised the family there. And raised the family there. Yeah. And settled down. And did you still fly planes casually? Or did, was that after, the end of your flying experience? You know, after World War II, I still used to fly, go up to Bedford. Yeah. Out a plane and go sightseeing and, and buzz, buzz the minute. The winter for sake boat. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. And, uh, so, so yeah. Look, looking back, what did you, how do you feel about your whole service? I mean, you've told a wonderful story. You certainly have great memories here. Very good. Um, they're all very clear. Yeah. Was it a wonderful thing? Yes, I learned a lot. I, I, I learned. And I had a marvelous time flying. I enjoyed flying in, in World War II. Korea, mm -hmm. not so much. I was flying at night up and down the valleys and in the mountains, you know, and stuff. And, and just the flying was, was not easy. Uh, yeah. But uh, World War II, I liked flying. The P-51 was a marvelous plane to fly. And, and you could do acrobatics and all kinds of things. So I, I liked that part of it. I mm -hmm. learned a lot. Do you still get out there when the Blue Angels come or and to watch them do their stuff? We used to go up in the clouds and the, and after the war, we used to continue to practice like ground gunnery on, on the, the lake. They'd have mm -hmm. targets on the lake. We'd go down there and the, the people running the, the target thing would have a couple of nurses or something there or some women, there, a couple of women there. And so we would get on the targets and show off. After we strafe the targets, we turn over and, and take do a slow roll on the way up. And so we, we did all kinds of things like that. And, and some of the men had, had brothers and stuff in the German cities. So we used to go down there and get on the main street below the buildings, you know, <laughs> and buzz through there. So, so it, was, it was fun. I, I liked the flying. Yeah. But I think it's great that the boy who grew up in a family without a car ended up, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know what you call it, piloting a B-51 plane over France and so forth. That's amazing when you think of that story. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah, I was, uh, I when I thought about it once in a while, I felt good about it. You know, that yeah. I would do that and uh, and just yeah, you should. maneuvers, you know. Yeah. Well, we thank you. Go enjoy your beautiful Sunday. It's a gorgeous day out there, a little cold, but go enjoy it. And thank you so much for talking to us. And the other thing we do is, is a loop. But when you're up at the top, we roll it over so we're right side up again. Yeah, we did lazy eights and when learning is in the, in the airplanes you have a like a, a needle and a ball and the ball is like a carpenter's thing, you know, and it tells you whether you're going straight. If you push too much rudder, that ball will slide off. So, so when you're doing these maneuvers, you're looking at that ball that it's staying in the center. And uh, and that's what these maneuvers like a like a lazy eight, which is like a horizontal eight with the loops elevated. And you do a climbing left turn, and you do a diving left turn, and so forth, doing eights. And all that time, you're keeping an eye on that ball to make sure you're coordinated and flying straight rather than slipping. Uh, if you're doing a a roll, you. You're doing this. Right. right. Okay. okay. And if you're doing a, a snap roll, it's the same thing. You don't do a snap roll with fighters. They can't take the they can't take the stress on it. But but that's what it would be the same thing, but it will be zipping right around. If you're doing a loop, you're you're going up this way. And uh, and then back down. If you're doing what they call an Immelman, which is a fighter tactic you can use, you would do a half a loop 
and then rotate the plane so you're right side up again. Hmm. I don't know if you can see enough of that in the picture. Yep. And, and, and when you want to fly, when you're flying, you want to fly straight. And so that ball is right in the middle. And, and if you're flying this way, you, you're not getting maximum efficiency because your propellers are pushing you that way and you're going that way. So uh, you want that ball to be right in the middle so you're flying right toward the nose and, and you get a maximum speed out of it that way. You don't do too much instrument flying in a fighter, but in the B-26, we did a lot of instrument flying. So, uh, but yeah, if you were flying, no matter whether you're flying visually or, or in the clouds, you, if you're in the clouds, you, you're just following your instruments. You can't see the ground or anything else. Right. So you're following the needle and the ball and the airspeed and, and you have a gyro compass and all that sort of thing. In the picture that you've got of the inside of the cockpit of the 51, there's a, there's a, a group of Instruments, the main instruments you use when you fly are in that white line that's painted on the instrument panel.